Welcome to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. I'm your co-host, Adiola Adejobi, with co-host Jason Clark, president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Great, thank you, Adiola. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, the Metropolitan Black Bar Association is the largest bar association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. Our goal is to advance equality in the pursuit of justice, assist in the professional development of our members, and address legal issues affecting New Yorkers. Now the purpose of the Raising the Bar with the MBBA series is to foster a substantive conversation about justice issues in our community and to try to identify a couple of solutions in the, uh, in the process. Today we're going to look at consumer scams. Joining us today are attorneys Carl Forbes and we also have uh, Preston Baker who's in financial services. Now, when we're talking about consumer scams, I mean, there's so many out there. Preston, you know, why don't we start with you? Like, what's one type of scam that people should be aware of so that they can kind of protect themselves from, you know, people out there trying to, um, to steal their money? You know, as we're going into the tax season, IRS scam is something that is, is very, very utilized in, in the scammers market, I guess you could call it that. But um, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll reach out to you and say that you you owe or you didn't pay the debt, they didn't receive it. They use a lot of technology nowadays where they're able to mimic the actual IRS uh, taxpayer act um, assistance center's number and they'll tell you to look on, on the website to see that the number matches. But if the IRS is calling you, one, they're not going to ask you for, for you to wire transfer any money. They're not going to ask you to use a debit card, to put money on a debit card. They're gonna, if they are gonna, if you are sending money to IRS, it's usually, usually United States Treasury. That's where you would, you, you write a check to the IRS, so. Yeah, and that's interesting that you say that. So from, I know from, just to uh, flesh it out a little bit, I know when we're talking about the IRS scam, uh, usually what you'll hear is that someone will get a phone call from someone who's saying that, you know, I'm with the IRS or what have you. And I think one of the reasons, at least, and I've certainly received a call, I've known people who have received this call, and I feel like one of the reasons why it can be pretty effective is when someone calls and says that, uh, you know, there's an issue with, uh, you know, your, your tax papers and then the IRS. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm just talking for myself, but I'm never completely sure, you know, when you're putting in all those paper that everything is correct. For all you know, there's some issue here or there, so I think there's like a level of like authenticity that something could happen. And I think really the hook when we're talking about these type of scams is, uh, I know with the IRS scam, they'll say things like, uh, if you don't pay right now, we're going to come in the morning and lock you up. We're going to come by and arrest you. And at that point, at least from what I've heard, that that's when people will always start to like, you know, feel like, you know, I need to do something now. And I think that's maybe the pressure that gets people well, yeah, to they, pay money. There's a threat of arrest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that they report you to immigration, they can suspend your license. I, IRS doesn't do any of these things. If, they're, if, they, if the federal, if they send law enforcement, they're not gonna come and ask for money at all. So they're, they, they're not gonna actually arrest you and say, well, write a check right now. So the, when, you, when, you look, when you look at it that way, when they threaten you, like you said, it's, there is that fear because you're, you're like, everybody's scared of IRS, right? <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to right. hear the IRS is coming after them. But the, the real thing is that they're not going, before they even get to making that call to you, you received quite a few notices. You're, you're going to receive notices in the mail that says that you owe a debt, you're delinquent on your taxes, or anything that they have, they'll, they're going to send you notice, notification first, then they'll reach out to you. And they're not going to ask you to verify their number on the website, you know. So just be aware that they do use fear, and it's just about having awareness. There, there are a lot of, Iris has uh, this on their website. They have quite a few scams that, that are run through that they say people are using, utilizing all the time. So mm -hmm. there, there are quite a few other scams. But that's probably the main thing is calling and, you know, putting that fear in you that, something can happen to you, but they cannot revoke your driver's license. They cannot, they cannot uh, suspend your business license. They cannot, they're not going to deport you. Uh, they, they, that's not what IRS does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just to add to that, I think one of the things mm -hmm. that a, a consumer can do if they get a call from a potential scammer is hang up and go to the IRS website and call the number back, right? The scammers are playing on people's fear and the pressure that they're placing on them and hoping they give into it. But instead, if you can find it in yourself to relax, hang up, go to a website, call the number, 
then you know you're reaching directly to the IRS and likely they're going to tell you we only send you things in writing and so if there is an issue you're going to receive it in writing you and or your accountant if you use one to file your taxes and then take the process from there. And, and that's just uh, definitely when we're talking about this. If there's one thing I think people should keep in mind is that, you know, the IRS, they will send you lots of materials. They will continue to send you paperwork and paperwork, but they do not call and tell you that we're going to arrest you the next day, right. you know, if you don't do it. And what you also notice, at least when I've heard about these type of scams, is that, you know, when they'll always say, like, we're going to arrest you, like, the next day. You know, it's never like in a week or what have you. And I think part of that is because they know if you have some time to think about it or to talk to somebody or do some research, mm -hmm. then you start pulling on that thread and the whole scam comes apart. And that's one of the things I think we'll probably see with some of these other scams is that, you know, there's some like hook that makes you, you know, in this case it would be fear, but there's also some type of impractical deadline that's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to get you to make a decision right on the spot, give you the money now because you have some type of, in this case, some type of fear. With the IRS, you also have the opportunity to appeal. So mm. if they're asking for the money, you can appeal that's and you can point. fight. You can, you can say, I want to appeal this, that I don't owe this money. So if they, like you said, if they're asking you tomorrow, tomorrow, right now, there's always something wrong with that. Right. And Jason, I think to your point, that's why programs like this are important. Education is key. So if we can help educate the consumers in advance when these calls or emails or things, uh, various scams happen, people will have in their back of the mind, oh, I remember watching that show and learning, don't jump at the fear because, uh, as Preston said, I can appeal. Or I know there's a resource I can go and talk to in a short amount of time that will help me even if it is next day. And if someone were to show up to claim to arrest you, you know how to potentially handle that. And one thing actually, I guess maybe just a last point on that, uh, which comes to mind is that, you know, it seems like a lot, when they're talking about the IRS scam, a lot of times it seems like people are calling, uh, you know, like, like home landlines. And it's not like on your cell phone. And I think that part of it is that they're really trying to focus on um, people who are more pre, uh, predisposed or more vulnerable to be taken advantage of. So when you have someone who's more elderly, like, uh, you know, your grandparent or, you know, s someone who may be, you know, who still uses the landlines and may be more susceptible to be taken advantage of, you know, I think that's like the type of cir circumstance where, um, um, people are more likely to get taken advantage of. So, so that raises a good point that makes me think about there's an actual grandparent scam, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is scammers are looking at people who are the most vulnerable. So we talked about fear. Uh, when elderly, there's also an attention factor, right? Uh, grandparents potentially are lonely or their families are doing their thing and so scammers take advantage of that. And so the way uh, the grandparent scam works is essentially uh, an elderly person will get a call late at night and it will either be from someone pretending to be their grandchild or saying they're a friend of their grandchild and the grandchild is in danger. So they may have gone on a vacation to Europe and you get a call saying they're out of money, they've lost their phone, can you wire money immediately? Or they're in the States but they've been arrested and we need money to get them out of jail. And so it plays on your base instinct of I have to help my family member and in turn saying I've got to get them the money immediately and unfortunately people say well that never works in reality um, studies have shown last year that uh, elderly have lost about half a million dollars wow, to goodness. this type of scam alone right and and it makes sense because you're worried what if I don't help this person my grandchild sounds like my grandchild or they have actual information about the child right these scammers are sophisticated and so a piece of advice that someone can use to deal with that is, again, it's a timing thing. You're thinking, I've got to deal with this immediately. But you get a call in the middle of the night. Call your son or daughter, the, the grandchild's parent, to try and get more information and confirm the story. It may turn out your grandchild's sleeping in bed right. and they weren't on any type of exactly. vacation. Right. And, and so again, it goes back to that education point. And they're trying to take advantage of you but the more you know is the better prepared you can be to deal with these situations. Yeah, and, and that, that makes total sense. I mean, for one, I mean, I hear about these things and it honestly just gets me angry. Um, you know, there are people out there who for whatever reason decide that, you know, they're going to try to 
you know, use whatever skills they have uh, to try to take advantage of, especially elderly folks. But yeah, I mean, I, I guess what we'd want to make sure that people know is that when you're talking about the grandparent scam, if somebody gives you a call, like in the heat of the night, you know, just like Carl said, you know, make sure you, you know, you verify first. Uh, I know that sometimes what I think can make it tricky too is that I think uh, I've heard about a couple of instances where they'll actually have someone say that, you know, I'm the police, uh, not the police officer, I'm the attorney that is assigned to your uh, granddaughter or grandson's case. So that way, you know, if it doesn't sound like the same voice, right. you know, it has that extra level of authenticity. And there's a point that you actually brought up that maybe we could go into a little bit too is that they have this information about you. You know, this, this information about you as an individual, and uh, you know, just talk a little bit before we go on to the next one about the role that, you know, maybe social media or the profiles that we have play in making someone susceptible to being scammed. A lot of times these, these, these people are very sophisticated, and with the, with the grandparent scam, I think they have a way of getting information out to you beyond social media, but as they're talking to the person. So mm -hmm. you're, you're already in, if I, if I call you today and I say someone you know was in an accident or something, or something of that nature, you, you're, you're already a little out of, you know, out of it. You're out of it, you're just 12 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it's, it's very easy to ask, to say, to kind of influence the questions in that manner. So you can say, I can easily say, I'm, oh, this is Jimmy. Uh, you know, and you're already gonna start having a conversation as if it was Jimmy, you know, so now you're giving more information than you may have. So the best thing to do is kind of like, like Carl said, is speak to, speak to the parent. You know, if, 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 if there's an injury or there's something going on, parents will know about it or they can find out about it, so. And I think to the social media point, it's unfortunate that many people live their lives on social media, so they reveal more information than generally you would like, and so it leads to the ability for people to be able to say, well, I'm this person's friend, when they don't know them, they've never met them, mm -hmm. they have nothing to do with their life, and it plays into their ability to con a grandparent or someone else's uh, part of these scams. And, Part of why they're sophisticated, it's a volume business for them. So you say, like, right. they're wasting their time. Well, if they con one out of 10 people or one out of 100, they're making money. And so they're going to continue to do it and come up with new ways in order to accomplish um, their goals. But the social media thing is a huge one that's being used a lot today. And I think that's a good point because people post their birthdays, they post where they're from, they post their high yeah. school, their college, their friends. And so if you're connected, and even if you're not, a lot of information you can see, particularly if they have their profile open. Yeah. So personally, um, I use social media, but Facebook, for instance, <laughs> um, I stopped using actually when I was studying for the bar exam and just it was a distraction and never went back but i understand there may be person than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but i understand there may be some scams that are, are taking place on, on facebook and you know that have moved from email like the nigerian print scam and and now they've moved into facebook where a lot of that information um, like your birthday and other things mm -hmm. are plastered everywhere talking on on the grandparent scam there's there's a uh, a system that they've have developed with it as well is so the person will call that says it's your grandchild, but they, they're incapacitated, so they'll say a lawyer's calling. So they, that, that, what you were talking about as far as the lawyer, there's a process of how they're doing it. So they, they plan on, they'll, the person will call and say, I can't talk right now, you know, I'm in a situation, my attorney's gonna call. Mm -hmm. So when the attorney calls, they'll have like a, a, a code or a number that they give the attorney that they give the grandparent to give to the attorney, so they feel like it's, it's actually a, legi a legitimate process. And when the lo when the attorney actually calls them, now they're saying, well, we need you to wire this money. So if you're in a situation you need to wire money right away, I would say, I would say to find out more about the information before you have to wire money because that's how they get you. It's, it's just like a process, a two-step process, and then they follow up. And a lot of times with these grandparents, they're not just getting them once, they're hitting them two or three times. So they'll come back and say, we need more money, or yeah. we need more money. Oh yeah, once and, they know that, uh, yeah. you know, you've given money once, you know, they'll just keep going back and keep going back until it's over. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that also goes to what, uh, something Carl was starting to go into uh, when we talk about, like, you know, the Nigerian scam. Uh, I mean, I think most people have certainly heard about that, uh, where, I guess what we mean by that is, you know, you get an email by someone saying that, 
you know, they're, uh, let's say they're a prince or what have you, and they need help with moving money, you know, some huge amount of money into another account. And if you give them your social security number and your bank account and all this other information, uh, and it's kind of laughable, but to like what Carl's saying, I mean, it's a numbers game. If you get enough people to do it, you start making the money. But now they've even started taking it like their new sophisticated levels of doing it. And this, I guess, kind of goes into this idea of phishing. And, um, is there someone here who may, uh, let's say maybe Carl, uh, want to give the definition of, uh, of phishing? So phishing is basically someone um, spoofing someone else. Typically you see it in email, where an email address looks to be the same as an email you're used to using, like customer service at a company. And they're seeking certain information from you in order to then potentially steal your identity or um, con you for money. Mm -hmm. And so what I understand is happening now on Facebook is people are spoofing um, one of your Facebook friends and sending, using Facebook Messenger to send uh, a message saying they need some type of help or they're in trouble or have you heard about this great new um, government benefit that's taking place but you have to pay some money in order to get the benefit and the money which generally never makes sense right. um, and isn't something that happens so that's my understanding of what how the phishing has evolved from the original typical emails that look like they're coming from a legitimate business or person you know and they're moving it into social media now. And then also with social media, sometimes people are duplicating accounts. Oh, yeah. So sometimes it's hard for people to know that it's not their friend or it's not their cousin that's writing them those messages. I actually have a friend that that happened to and I actually had to call her because the same situation what you're talking about where it starts off the conversation started off regular hey how you doing how you been and then it was all of a sudden you can take be a part of this program with the government you just have to pay fifty dollars or a hundred dollars mm -hmm. and it was just very interesting because I would never known her to do something like that so I called her and I said I asked her are, are you sending me messages on Facebook and she said you know you're not the first person that called me mm -hmm. somebody had created an, another site another page with her same name and, and just duplicated the pictures, just copy and paste the pictures on their page, and it looked just like her page, but the only difference was there were about 30 friends instead of 2,000 friends. So, right, right, right. so you know, that, that has happened, and, you know, I've, I've actually witnessed it and had to report it to Facebook, and they deleted the profile. Yeah, so. and you weren't the only one. That's not the only friend you have that that happened to, uh, for any of you guys, because that <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> this all happened to me. I mean, it must have been about two months ago. I got something. I even wrote some of it down here. They said, have you heard of the federal government Department of Workers' Compensation Appeal? So they have this long name that sounds like it's official, but you've never maybe heard of, right? And I know when I got, when that happened to me, uh, you know, they use very neutral language, like, hey, how are you? Have you heard the great word? And then they start, and again, like in this, it came from somebody who I was friends with, with on Facebook. The same thing happened to me maybe about like six months ago on Instagram. And it, again, it had that person's uh, picture to it. You know, they were talking about, hey, there's this great opportunity. I saw your name on a list as a winner. You're like, wow, that's great, right? So now we're not talking about fear, but we're talking about the, you know, the promise of getting some type of money. And uh, you start going through. It's like, wow, that's great. You know, and then they say, you know, why don't you reach out to this person? And you got to give this amount of money. And then that's when you start to realize, oh, wait a minute. You know, this seems a little odd. And then you start thinking, at least in the way I did for this is, this person usually doesn't reach out to me on Facebook Messenger. You know, this person doesn't reach out right, to me. Right. You know, and, but I would have to say, even for me, you know, I thought about it for a second. I was like, oh, wow, this is great. This is somebody I know. And maybe, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for me here. Uh, so that's why it's just so important, uh, you know, just to be careful with your information. And even when you're talking about the email, I mean, I got something from someone saying that he was a judge asking for me to put money on a, um, on a on an iTunes card to send over to him. And that's why I was like, okay, wait a minute. I know this is a little bit, but I don't know if we know each other that well where he's going to say, hey, right, you know, I right. need some money. Can you put it on an iTunes co uh, card and send it over to me? So I actually, uh, and I verified that, that he was not actually doing that. And look, Preston started to touch on how you, you deal with it. And so in the initial one, you think to yourself, is this something or someone who would ask or share this type of information with me? Then in the midst of talking to them, you can start to ask verification questions about them yes, personally. Exactly. I, you know, 
um, special moments you may have shared or, or things you've done in the past together, and then move to what Preston said of picking up the phone. I think often we don't like talking on the phone anymore, but <laughs> picking up the phone and saying, hey, I just got this message from you, I'm a little skeptical, and if they verify it is actually them, then you decide whether you want to move forward with the information they're giving you or the opportunity or not. But more times than not, it's probably not going to be because they're going to reach out to you about something like that in a more personal manner, personable manner than um, Facebook Messenger, for instance, or at least that's what I'd like to think. Right, mm. right. Especially for you since you're on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. So uh, yeah, so it's great. So we only have a couple minutes left. Um, so we're probably not going to be able to get through um, all the other scams. But what are some others that people should at least be aware of? Uh, you know, Preston and Carl, um, that we should, you know, people should just be careful of. And if they hear something about it, just you know, do a little extra vetting before they give any money to anybody. Well, I think one of the ones you hear is ATM skimming, and so often mm -hmm. people will. Um, say be careful about using ATMs in delis or outside of actual banks because there may be a machine that's skimming the information in the camera so just keeping your awareness of that. Um, one other I'd mention is the prize and sweepstakes. We talked about that before. The allure of making a lot of money and often they'll say we need your social security number and your bank account information in order to um, send the money to you for the prize that you've won. Well they could send you a check, right? Or they can give you information where you can come down and actually claim the money as opposed to giving them such personal information. With those types of things, they may say, well, we have to report it to the IRS. They should be giving you the paperwork that you need to fill out mm -hmm. to the IRS, or they'll deduct the money from the um, your winnings and then send it to you directly. So those are a few to look out for. I think the main thing is there, there are many scams, and there these people are very sophisticated nowadays, but the idea is really to make that extra call, verify, don't give out your information. I think the m most important thing is people are giving out, you know, especially with identity theft is a big thing, um, giving out their social security numbers over the phone. That's that's something you, if, if you're working with the company and they already have your social security, you don't have to verify it too often that you, there's a situation where you have to verify social security card your social security number. So I, I, my thing is just verify who you're speaking to, you know, make, take that extra, you know, with all these different scams, where we had the grandparent scam where you're making an extra call, the IRS, you're making that extra call. Just sit back for a minute, think about it because, and, and it could, it'll hurt you more than it will help you. And it's, sometimes it's hard to catch up with these people there. It's very hard to track them. And one, one major thing is once they get your information, it goes into this black market and you become, you yeah. become actually on the list of, of easy victim because you've been victimized before. So now they know that you're susceptible to it. So yeah. we'll, run, we'll run it again. We might run it a different way, but we'll run it again and again and again. So your information is now being sold over and over again. Yeah, and really quickly, can you talk about the energy bill scam? Because I think what's interesting about that is people actually show up at your door, which is very different than an email or a call or something like that. My understanding of energy bill scam is essentially someone from your energy provider, let's say here in New York, Con Edison, mm -hmm. um, will show up wearing the Con Edison clothes binder. and say, <laughs> right, with the yeah. binder that yeah. has the Con Edison logo on it and say there's an issue um, with your account and so they'd like to go over the bill with you. And it's twofold. One is um, for some, because energy provision is or a service is now deregulated that there are other energy providers who are looking to get your account information the account number because then they can switch over your energy supply mm. um, or they want to sell you on a really low energy supply rate but they tell you you've got to sign up quickly um, and then you don't read the fine print and the reality is like a credit card for potentially you get a interest rate initially that's really low mm. but then the rates gonna go higher and so it's similar there um, with the energy and one of the other threats they'll use is um, if you don't let me in and talk to me your energy is gonna be turned off immediately mm. Mm. and that typically the uh, Con Ed or energy companies they're going to call you they're going to send you letters again uh, despite being in the social media and digital age uh, the government and formal entities are still using paper. They're right. going to mail you, or if you've signed up for paperless, 
they're going to email you with an official notice and then you have to call them to follow up they're not going to send someone or if they are they're going to call you first and let you know that they're going to send someone but all of that um, goes back to protecting yourself and so there are uh, people should take advantage of resources that are out there. The New York State Attorney General's Office does a lot to protect consumers as well as the New York City Division of Consumer Affairs. Go on their websites, give them a call, and talk through these situations with them to ultimately protect yourself. Yeah, Great. Yeah, yeah. Terrific. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you, Preston. Thank you, Carl, for coming in and uh, giving us a little bit of expertise uh, about scams and how we can protect ourselves. Thank you at home for watching Raising the Bar with the MVBA on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And see you next time. <laughs>